Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the Horatius uh, Extraordinary Meeting run the World Summit today. Uh, we have an exciting panel from across Africa to share our insightful views on the revitalization of Africa. So let me take the opportunity to introduce you to my esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Dr. Anushka Bogdanov, and I would be your moderator. I'm the founding and managing director of Risk Insights, a data science and risk management company in South Africa. We have built South Africa's first predictive model for environmental, social, and governance, an African model for Africa. Uh, Dr. Nkem Kumba is the chairman of Africa Development Future Group, is a senior fellow at the Africa Global Federation of Competitive, uh, Competitiveness Council, is the faculty associate of science and technology and public policy, is a lecturer and the member of, a, of STEM Africa Initiative at the University of Michigan. Mr. Ezi Rapapo is the founder and CEO of Empower Africa. He is a passionate humanitarian and seasoned businessman with a mission to accelerate empowerment by driving investment, trade and job creation across Africa. He's the former director and global trading of um, uh, former director of global trading in Rappaport uh, Group. He's a uh, Harvard alumni and a member of the YPO. Um, Oopsie Daisy, sorry about that. Miss Cynthia Munguanwari is the founder of Yumbumwe uh, Foundation which supports the cause of uh, Burundian refugees living in Uganda. She's a trained psychologist and Burundian politician and social entrepreneur. Cynthia is also the founder of a fintech company called Ukosi, uh, Ukosi Koni, which is an e-commerce platform. Ukosi Koni sells 100 million products over 300 uh, vendors cutting across sourcing and uh, of logistics to offer truly global experience for Uganda. Mr. Blessing Ayamhere is the Managing Director of Umungini uh, Pipeline Infrastructure Limited, operating in the midstream of oil and gas sector. He's the President of Inspire Extra Empowerment Initiative, iExtra, a non-profit organization focused on capacity building and leadership amongst youth. He's a graduate and fi uh, of finance and banking from the University of Benin. He holds a master's degree in international finance and business management, as well as strategic planning from Edinburgh Business uh, School. He's an alumni both at uh, Lagos and uh, the Harvard Business School. Mr. Jean-Paul Nanfat is the CEO of Prime, Vest, uh, Prime Invest Co. He's, as, he's been admitted as a, uh, as a member of the prestigious Dubai Global Investor Leaders Club. He's presently heading in Kolbong, uh, New City, Green City Land Development, a mega project in Dola. He's the executive director and coordination of um, African Municipalities for Peace and Development, and is a member of the Investment uh, Forum Club in Geneva. The COVID-19 uh, crisis has exacerbated and aggravated financial and political and social crisis throughout the world and Africa is, has been no exception. It has taken an enormous toll on human life, placing pressure on uh, the health system, supply chain management, as well as negative impact on society. So our panelists here today uh, will share our views on how we will be looking at the revitalization of Africa and the impact of COVID-19 as well as pre-COVID-19 and the challenges that Africa has had, but also the opportunities that, South, uh, that Africa um, continues to, to bear. The continent has over 1.3 billion people and is the second largest continent representing 14% of our world population and which is set to grow to about 1.6 billion by 2030. So COVID-19 has created opportunities in digitization of economies, telemedicine, as well as infrastructure, which has um, been impacted positively by FinTech solutions, uh, which some of our panel members will be talking about, as well as some infrastructure 
uh, development uh, opportunities that have been um, uh, concluded within uh, the African continent. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Mr. Uh, to Dr. Nkumba, who's going to take us through one of the first questions that we have. Uh, Dr. Nkumba, are you, can you hear me? Very clearly, thank you. I'm here. Yes. Hello, uh, Dr. Nkumba. So the challenges of COVID-19 has brought about some enormous opportunity to lead hog education transformation. How do you see this in the continent and what are the opportunities for Africa? Over to you, Dr. Kumba. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again at Horaces. Uh, this is my third time participating in these meetings. And it's also, it's also a pleasure. Uh, I congratulate uh, Frank for holding strong on this uh, forum and making it grow as it is. So concerning Africa, um, uh, as, you, uh, as you ask, uh, Africa, first of all, is not one continent where one, one sweep, one prescription can uh, be applicable to every region or every country, 54 countries, and uh, some variations in their internal dynamics. Uh, higher education, not only higher education, but education altogether, has been Africa's biggest challenge. Post-independence, uh, the priority for many African countries was to develop the manpower to run their bureaucracies. And uh, they succeeded enormously at that. But as the world changed towards uh, knowledge systems and uh, technologically driven economies, the, the continent didn't quite adapt its educational systems to match those shifts. And so they had a lag. Uh, the COVID has exacerbated that reality and make it very clear that uh, the current dispensation in African higher education needs to be very well revived towards the kind of tools, the kind of skills that can enable its citizens, its increasing youth board to manage their own society by themselves. So uh, the COVID has virtually drifted society towards virtual economies. Everything is online now. To be online, to be digital means science. It means computer science. It means the skills that can enable you run high-tech um, um, uh, systems. And so many African countries now are beginning to see that, indeed, the, this provides them a big opportunity to balance their educational systems, to make up for the lag that they have had for the last 30 years to 40 years, to balance and pivot their educational systems towards the kind of skills that will make them better adapt to the modern dispensation. For some of us, the COVID, ultimately, it's a scientific problem. Getting the vaccine is about science. Um, uh, managing the, um, uh, the healthcare systems uh, it's about uh, scientific and technological skills. And so industrializing, as Africa aspires to, through its free trade area and all the other activities that they were engaging in prior to the COVID, it's all about science. It's, it, 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 it's all about industrializing the country. And so some of us think that uh, the COVID just makes lazy very bare, that A, towards the continent. The continent is a big part of the global community. And as a weakest link, it can be a source of challenges that ripple to other parts of the world. The Ebola was an example. The COVID didn't come out of Africa, but other, other problems like the Ebola has come out of Africa. And so as a weak link, uh, it can, what arise out of there can adversely pack, uh, impact the rest of the world. And so skilling African youth with the required tools to be able to manage and industrialize their societies and build their own middle classes that are not dependent upon the public sector, as is, as is currently the case in many countries where the public sector dominates, the bureaucracy dominates, and that's the result of their educational system that trains for certification and for degrees and for work employment by the government. Now, if we have to go beyond that, then it means skilling the... Uh, uh, the young people through the school system from uh, early on through graduate programs with a kind of uh, technological uh, qualities that will enable them not only address the adverse effects of COVID, but 
come out of the con out of this COVID much more stronger in terms of the ability to manage themselves. That's a very very interesting and and uh, strong views, um, uh, Dr. Kumba. So if I want to take it from the uh, to Ezi, do you want to tell us a little bit about how education, uh, you know, leading from what uh, Dr. Kumba has told us uh, in terms of building a society, is looking at COVID nineteen and uh, you know looking at education. How do you envisage um, this taking place in the continent, and how would uh, governments ensure that the depth and the actions necessary to use education for the catalyst of revitalization of Africa? And bearing in mind that we have, um, you know, the, the vaccine, which is also science driven and education driven. Can you, you know, would you like to share some of your views, Ezi? Yes, thank you. Fantastic question. And education is indeed the foundation. For empowerment, you know, I travel throughout Africa, and I am humbled by the tremendous resilience, drive, and ingenuity of the people I meet. Education will not just unleash that value for Africa, but for the world. A third of the world in 2050, under the age of 30, will be in Africa. It is tomorrow's workforce. And while the governments indeed have a responsibility to, fill, to provide the citizens with the necessities to succeed, there's tremendous demand and opportunity from the private sector. PwC recently reported that 96% of CEOs in Africa view the unavailability of skilled labor as the biggest threat to their organization's growth. So I think the grand opportunity and solution here is the collaboration between the government and the private sector and public institutions. We need to see how to incorporate the private sector, how to incorporate other public institutions to support the development of the education sector. And in regards to the education sector, um, we cannot be blinded by the fact that Today, over 20%, perhaps 20% of children are still not going to primary school. Let's go bottom up. And a third of the children under the age of five today are malnourished, they're stunted. We have to address this fact. We need to get more children into school and we need to ensure that they can get to school, not behind the line. We need them to succeed and we need them to be able to compete on a global scale for tomorrow. In regards to increasing attendance in school, we have to reduce all barriers. Education should be free. These are dealing with some of the poorest people in the world. It is more, as the president of Sierra Leone says, it is President Bio, it is more expensive to care for an uneducated person throughout his life than investing in self, in investing in education to begin with. Significantly more expensive. So we cannot think of the cost, we have to think of the tremendous loss of human potential if we do not um, invest in the education of the children today. Secondly, in regards to increasing school attendance, we need to encourage the children and the families, we need to encourage the children to go to school. We gotta make school cool. We gotta work with the artists, we gotta drive sensitization. You could transform your life, you could create your future through your, uh, through your mind through education. So boosting attendance is really important. Now, once we get the children to school, we need to ensure there's quality education. 35% of primary teachers today, primary school teachers today in Africa, did not go through proper training. This cannot be, we have to invest in proper training for teachers. And in addition, we need to boost the introduction of technology. We have to introduce technology, computers, projectors. Today you could have, to, in order to distribute quality education, today you can have and you have Harvard University professors teaching children in villages in Africa. Let's, let's just keep driving that. Let's keep investing in technology. A third point is soft skills. It's not just about what you know, it's about how you think, learning how to get out of survival mode, learning how to create value. We as human beings can create value, we can create more value by working together, working with diverse people. And that's something you can learn 
in school. Very important to get children in school for that. And also to teach the private education vocational skills. Again, we have to work with the private sector. A bit of uh, reverse, you know, engineering over here. Get the private sector to tap in to this pool of talent and support vocational studies and work with the governments on that front. If I have one more minute, just one more minute, Anushka, I want to highlight a lot of time learning is in our work in Sierra Leone. Yeah. We work with artists, we work with technology, and I'm learning a lot. If people want to learn about education and how to transform a country and how to transform an education system, look today. We have a live case study in Sierra Leone. President Bio introduced two years ago three education. He brought back some of the diaspora. Harvard, a Harvard graduate, today the Minister of Education is mid to younger 30s, Harvard grad, PhD at MIT, studied at IBM, and they are transforming the whole education system. They're introducing technology. They're building relationships with Harvard University, MIT, Coursera, and, and really building out the quality education system in Sierra Leone. I highly recommend anybody who wants to learn about education and how it can transform a country, look today at Sierra Leone. It's a live Thank you, Izzy. Thank you so much. I think um, I want to take it to, uh, you know, to the next level because education, as uh, Dr. Kumba has uh, has noted, as well as Ezi, um, that, you know, we have um, opportunities that are created through education. So, so, Cynthia, would you like to tell us a little bit about the setup of the e-commerce platform? I mean, education and uh, being able to look at fintech solutions come from the from a, from, uh, from a stable background and foundation of education, right? So maybe you would like to tell us a little bit about how the digital age can be accelerated uh, during this pandemic using education, but looking at fintech solutions. You want to touch a little bit about that, Ms. Cynthia? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you to Frank for this great opportunity. I'm really challenged because, uh, as, as you know, I work with refugees in the camps. And those are refugees who came five years ago without speaking any language. They speak uh, only um, French. Myself, five years ago, I was only speaking French. And I'm here forced to learn English because I have to survive. And uh, we, because we, we need fintech. We need, we need science because we, these people must go to school. We need to create apps which can teach them. They cannot stop studying simply because they don't speak, they don't speak the language. We have teachers, we have doctors who are now forced to be uh, refugees and you're not going to start learning the language at 60. And today they are treated as people who are not educated simply because the, the language barrier is a main problem. It's a major problem. So we must really find a way of educating them in ways of finding apps for them to be educated and to improve their lives. I'm, um, I think I'm going to talk more about, about um, e-commerce because that's where I am, and that's what I, I do. And right now, I find people who can't even order. It's a, it's a new business in, in Uganda, even in Africa. You know, shopping online is crazy. You find someone has the, the money, has everything, but cannot access, uh, cannot use their computer or their, their phones to be able to buy any item. They have to come, and it comes back to the same where we started. The purpose of having an e-commerce platform is for you to be able to shop at home, not be able to come into traffic and whatever, but you are forced to come to, to our shops because you can't. You can't use your laptop. You can't use your phone. We must educate our people. The world is going to change, unfortunately. We're not going to be the same again. So we really, really must improve our way of uh, handling the new era of digital Thank you so much for that, uh, Cynthia. I think, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, yourself and Ezi, as well as, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Bukumba have all spoken about education leading to, uh, you know, being the foundation and then taking it to the next level of, uh, you know, looking at fintech. But I'd like to bring in Mr. B uh, Mr. Blessings here in terms of, you know, how does he see uh, the drive for innovation and entrepreneurship, tying it back up to what, uh, Ms. Cynthia has spoken about in terms of creating an e-commerce platform, creating an entrepreneurial spirit uh, on the back of education. So, you know, would you like to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how fintech 
and uh, you know the health facilities in Nigeria and infrastructure challenges uh, you know have been overcome uh, during the COVID period or what are st some of the challenges that still remain uh, within uh, Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Blessings, do you want to take us through that? Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me seize the opportunity to thank Frank and the team for a great job done. And uh, thank you also, uh, Nska, for, for um, good leadership. Thank you to everyone that I've spoken. I, indeed, you have actually set the stage right. Um, the truth is the fact that we know that Africa um, has got potentials um, and also had opportunities. The unfortunate thing is that more attention has been paid to the challenges instead of the opportunities. And I think the balance is what we need to start discussing because the balance of this, we actually throw up where the opportunity actually lies. We come to, um, we've talked about education, but we also know that the bricks and mortar education has not helped over time. So we need to do education differently. And one of such education is in entrepreneuring. Okay, the school system that we have had up till now has trained people to be employees. People go to school, they come out, they are looking for jobs. And you have graduates that have finished school, they have all kinds of degrees for five years, for 10 years, there's no job and they are not able to sit down to create something. And so they need to begin to discuss and empower people to do things for themselves, to create opportunity has become even more important. And that is where I have seen opportunity. And my organization, for example, the NGO, we decided to say, okay, let us see how we can empower people in terms of entrepreneuring and in terms of leadership. Can we begin to have conversation about it, you know? It is not enough to carry the paper around. Can you check what are the problems? You know, the good thing about it is this. For every problem you go through, thousands of people are going through, if not, if not millions. And if you can solve that problem for yourself, you are actually solving problems for millions of people. And so looking inwards and taking strength from saying, I have this problem and I need to solve it, you are also providing that platform for other people. So we need to take the education from the level where it currently is to the next level where we are asking people to say, you have learned how to read and how to write. That is fundamental. But you don't need to wait until the government creates opportunity for you. The interesting thing in Africa today is that no government can create opportunity for everybody. You know, easy mention and gave statistics of the number of people. You have huge and vibrant, you know, youth population in Africa. And in the next few years, you know, you get the Africans leading in terms of the youth percentage. So what can we do? We can't fold our hands. We need to wake up and we need to take this challenge to the next level. But we can't do it alone as well. The government have to step in to support in entrepreneurial uh, policies and environment. What we are asking and what we are saying to leaders is create the environment, create infrastructure, create support system, create access to finance, and let the people go out there and do things. Africans are very creative. Africans are restless. They want to do something. But you know what the difference we see is the fact that they don't have the support system. There's no access to phone. There's no access to power. There's no access to electricity. There's no access to data. You know, these things are inhibiting growth, as it were. And the the COVID era actually threw up a lot of, you know, advantages that we saw during this time. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of people that never thought it was possible doing a lot of things. E-commerce took to the center stage. Telemedicine, for example, took the center stage as well. I, I had the reason to actually make a consultation with the doctor. I didn't need to go. Go to the party of two hours, go and sit down for another one hour waiting. No, just by putting on a phone call, you know, 10, 20 minutes, we are done. I paid less, I saved time, and I had a lot of other things to do. In fact, I felt better with that kind of engagement. And this is what the government needs to have next. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Blessing. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's amazing. I think what Blessing is uh, you know, great. Okay. 
Absolutely. I think, uh, sorry about that. I thought I had a little bit of a buffer. Uh, thank you, Blake. I think, you know, the point that you make is that we have uh, a very young, uh, the, the African continent as a very, very young nation. And uh, we have the ability to ensure that we have a labor force that is young and that is vibrant and we can create opportunities. So, Dr. Kumba, you know, coming back to what our panelists have been talking about, uh, with all of these opportunities, there's a whole lot of challenges that also come into play. How do we attract investment into, into Africa for this revitalization? Um, can, you, can you comment on that, uh, Dr. Kumba? Yes. Uh, the way investment is typically attracted to, uh, to, any, to any economy, to any community, is to foster talent in, a, in, a, in an environment that can translate the investment into products that can yield return for investors. So there are cluster points on the continent. Nairobi, for example, Accra in Ghana, Dakar, Senegal, Chigali in, in, in uh, Rwanda. That has a cluster of strong, innovative, young, um, uh, talented people where uh, the kind of uh, products that would make investor returns worthwhile I, 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 I exist. Another one is for the African governments themselves. Lots of resources coming to the continent in, in, in terms of aid or in terms of whatever international uh, funding instruments exist for the continent. And uh, providing the kind of incentives that would make investors uh, less wary about the risk of the uh, of, um, involved in, in, in in those economies would be very very useful. Uh, I give you an I give you a, an example. Many high tech companies, IBM, Apple, you know, we have a university, Carnegie Mellon, out of uh, the, the U.S. They've been trying to set up um, uh, offices, set up shop on the continent, and the biggest con concern that comes out of things like that is one, the regulatory environment. Two, the cluster of skills where they can tap into. And uh, the opportunities abound. But, but in my opinion, the regulatory environment, the, the, the proximity, the, let me put it this way, a certain arrangement between the university system and the governments and the industries that can actually um, um, create the kind of conversations that would take is, um, um, an idea from a young person or from whoever that person is and provide a kind of uh, further training to refine the ideas, like, more like, like project development, like um, business plan development, and uh, give on, on also provide the industrial outlet where these ideas can have um, um, uh, commercial um, um, uh, possibility. Uh, those are things that what we've been advocating for, for, uh, for a long time through uh, uh, the Africa Development Futures Group. That even those who want to invest on the continent, because it's a virgin territory, but the opportunities are bound, trying to bring together a consortium of mm -hmm. academics and industry people and a few government people can provide the kind of mini ecosystem that will make investments very worthwhile for whoever wants to invest in, in the continent. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumba. I think one of the things that's quite interesting, uh, you know, the latest statistics we've seen that there's over 400 uh, African uh, companies uh, on the continent that have uh, turnovers of over a billion dollars. And, uh, you know, and, and most of these companies have grown from really grassroots level. So it, it's interesting to see that, with, uh, you know, with the right leadership, right education levels, and, you know, we can forest gum or leapfrog uh, into progression quite, uh, you know, effectively if we have the right levels of support. Um, I, I would like to just bring in, uh, you know, Mr. Blessings back into um the conversation, you know, in terms of how does leadership and strategy play a role in driving this type of progression? Uh, you know, you have a, a, a great company as well. Um, Blessing, maybe you want to, you know, bring in 
you know, how you've been able to grow this company, uh, you know, uh, in the oil and gas sector and, uh, you know, the type of support that you've, uh, you know, and leadership that you've been able to uh, to bring into the company. Would you like to comment on that uh, blessing? Okay. Um, the line was um, parking a little bit. I'm not sure I got the beginning. Um, what I heard you say, talk about leadership that I've been able to bring to the company. But I didn't hear what you said before that. I, I was just saying that we've got quite a number of companies, over 400 companies in, on the African continent that have over a billion dollars in turnover. And that has come through, you know, having that support, uh, you know, throughout the continent. And, we, you know, we seem to be able to leapfrog. Uh, if we actually apply our minds, right? So I just want to be, I'm trying to understand from your side, what have you seen in terms of your, your company as well as, you know, the effectiveness in Nigeria in the oil and gas sector, yeah? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think the fact that there is huge opportunity in Africa is, um, and Nigeria to be specific, is, is known to everyone. But let me pause a little bit to, to mention this. Today is our independence, 60th independence, Nigeria 60th independence celebration. So um, I, I think it's a good time right now because everybody's looking at this issue of leadership. Um, what next? What have we done in the past 60 years? Where are we and where can we go to? And so in the oil and gas, I, I think um, it, has, it has helped to sustain the Nigeria economy in these past 60 years. And the question we are asking ourselves is, what next in the next 60 years? Can we continue to rely on the oil and gas? The oil and gas contributes so much forex, but the GDP contribution is low, and the number of employment is able to generate as well is very low. I think that the oil and gas is supposed to be a platform for developing other subsectors of the economy, all the sectors of the economy things like education, things like technology um, and, and infrastructure. So I think we've lost. Can you hear me? He was just speaking about technology and infrastructure. So <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to skip through to to Cynthia and yes. uh, with all of this. Um, operates. Ah, we have him back. We have him back. We can. Um, can you hear me? Can no, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we lost him for a little while. But Cynthia, you want to kind of take us into, you know, this, uh, you know, with all of this progression in Africa, we've also got quite a bit of gender discrimination, and that's across the globe, right? And it's quite a topical subject, um, you know, uh, in the whole world. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about African women uh, and leadership in, uh, on the continent and some of the opportunities we've seen. Blessing, we have to we have to stop you for a while and I'm gonna put Cynthia on and we can come back to you. Would that work? Because you, you've been buffering okay. a bit. Oh, okay. I, I noticed that as well. That's fine, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Anushka. As a member of a women network association called Famous Africa, I've been able to see how amazing our African women are. Studies shows that we are re the most reliable Courageous and less corrupt. I second that. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> you know? They're less corrupt. And then um, I hear right that women are every bit as capable of being good political leaders than men. I'm, I'm going to even <laughs> help men. I'm not a feminist, but we must, you know, talk about facts, you know. <laughs> 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 um, I'm going to mention what we do in our in our women network. We are um, mediators, and here I'm going to talk about three things we have been able to mediate, which are very, which was very, very hard to deal with. I'm going to talk about how in uh, um, this year in August in Sudan we managed to criminalize the law to criminalize the the genital um, um what do you call it the femoral genital mutilation. As you know, it was a crazy uh, situation for years, but it, it took women, few women, 
to be able to stop it. I'm going to talk about the history of Uganda, where in north of Uganda, we had someone called Konyi. They are still there, but at least we got women who managed to go and see him. And today we have women who come back, kids who are abducted who come back and who are now living and doing business. So we really need to put women, inclusion of women is very, very important. It's sad that some of the African countries, women are still really be there to get married and not to be educated. So we really must find a solution for involving them. Because uh, I'm here to, as you know, we are in COVID and you have seen the women who have really done a lot in New Zealand, in Germany, in Bangladesh, Have, have we lost women have Cynthia? handled very well this pandemic more i guess i guess that's it we hear you now yes we can you hear me yeah so um, I, I, I here i've made some points which show that leadership traits such as intelligence and capacity for innovation with many saying they're stronger than men in terms of being compassionate and organized leaders it took us, Anushka, to organize all of us. We are here today. <laughs> yeah. so that's the reason why really we should really, really improve how we see women, how we should involve them by educating them and remove these women from grassroots, not taking them for granted. They must not, probably they're not educated, but there's a lot, a lot they can do to improve our community. And if you can allow me, I think I need to go back from the e-commerce because I need to mention some key issues, some key challenges we have, because I think we don't have enough time. You'll give me one or two minutes. I'm going to give you, I'm going to allow you one minute. One minute. So I'm oh, going right. to really talk about a challenge which I want all of you to help me find solution for. As you know, yes, we have this e-commerce uh, e who is booming, but we have a very serious problem. Uh, I think Blessings talked about it, lack of funds, which is a very, very big issue. Cap venture capital is almost impossible in Africa. So we use our own saving, which is really, really hard. And uh, there's another problem which I want to mention here, flea markets. It's, real, it's going to be very, very hard for us to change the mentality. Every five meter in Africa, you find shops. So I don't know how we're going to move from free road markets to digital markets. So I want, it's going to be a homework for all of us to find a way of changing the mentality in order to move forward in this new era. For the opportunities, we have them. Africa is the fastest growing economy. We have wonderful countries like Ghana, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire who are really, really moving fast in, uh, in technology. And I'm very, very optimistic that uh, we are going very far, but we need to solve some really issues like flea markets and the issue of funding and network and power. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. I think, you know, uh, the problems uh, that we have or the challenges that uh, we have uh, are not unique in terms of being women, right? Uh, it's across the world, so it's not just Africa. But uh, I think absolutely uh, key is, is gender equality. And I think one of the things that we've done, um, you know, in our company is actually we've created the NESG model, which starts looking at uh, social inclusivity and going across the board, not just women, but taking into, into account ethnic, ethnicity, uh, race, color, creed, um, you know, gender equality. So I think that is factor in terms of transformation across the world is extremely important that we are all seen as equal. So that's very, very important. Uh, I'm still a feminist, but I do like uh, to, to ensure that we all take everyone into account. But uh, thank you for that. Uh, Izzy, I think I would, I'd like you to look at, you, you've been involved in so many projects across um, Africa, empowering uh, uh, Africans and, um, uh, and, and such amazing um, initiatives I think uh, Cynthia has posed a very in interesting question in terms of how do we solve some of these problems? And you've been helping solve some of it. 
Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you've been involved in and how you can, you know, um, share some of your thought leadership on this? Yes, fantastic. So first of all, before I, I jump into that, I echo both you, Cynthia and Anushka. Power to the women. <laughs> you know, they're good for their families, for the communities, and for the country. And, you know, I think the numbers are the women, they – they put 90% back of what they make into their family, into the education of their children, into making sure they get proper nutrition of the children compared to 40% with men. So, you know, so I think the women, um, I think also the region, Af Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region in the world that has a majority of women entrepreneurs. You know, they say necessity is the mother of invention, but uh, I think that the mothers out there, power to the women. I'm, I'm right with you, you wonderful ladies. And uh, it's, it's very, very important. Yes, I would say focusing on women, empowering women specifically is extremely important. Um, in regards to empowerment in general, I would, I would break it down into three areas. First of all, human capital development, as they phrase it, creating local, ethically transparent and efficient markets, business-friendly markets in different countries, and then doing proper international promotion, mm -hmm. creating more collaboration with the international markets. You know, in regards to human capital development, and a lot of what I'm learning, again, I'm learning from, humbly, from many different people in Africa, specifically in Sierra Leone, they break it down to three critical sectors. First of all, healthcare. Second of all, food security, making sure that we have food. Third of all, education. The president of Sierra Leone says, feed the mind, feed the tummy, and take care of the whole body. And then you can allow people, you have to enable people to live to their full capabilities and to their full being. We have to care for people, and that should not be overlooked. Significant investment and attention needs to go to human capital development in those three sectors. After that, and with that, we need to create a business-friendly environment. We need to help. Now we have people being able to be productive to their full being, how do we enable them to create the right organization and be able to engage with government in an efficient manner? We need to digitize the interaction between government and the private sector and ensure that there's no roadblocks, less human intervention. And the governments in Africa are many times the largest employers in the country. We need Thank to you, Ozzy. Ozzy, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to steal into your time. Blessing, we had missed you for a minute. Uh, so you want to do a little bit of a closing for me, and then I will do the last bit of the closing because we've literally got 47 seconds left. So tell us okay. a little bit more about the African Renaissance. Okay. So th thank you so much. Uh, again, I want to focus on the fact that we've got huge opportunity, but we also need to be focused on what we need to do at this time. Partnership is key, but I will say leadership is equally the bedrock to driving this um, revitalization that we need, this next boom that we need. And where we need government is in terms of policy development. You know, creating policy, policy that creates enabling environment, policy no. that Dr. creates. Kumba. You okay. want to say your last word, Dr. Kumba? Well, I, I, time is up. Time is up. Time's up. Yeah, time's up. <laughs> but, but thank you, though. I, it was a pleasure uh, being here with, with all of you, uh, fellow colleagues. And uh, thank uh, Frank for, the, for this uh, panel, especially the title Africa needs thank to be revitalized from all the challenges that it has so you can capture all the opportunities that lie ahead of me. So thank you all for being for having me here. Thank you very much, uh, all the panel members. Thank you for making the job so much easy. And uh, I, I loved it. So um, I, I hope to see you and keep in touch with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all. It was good meeting you. Thank you, Frank. God bless. Bye. 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 Up with Frank. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We're taking selfie, okay? Blessing. Great job, man. Yeah. <laughs> Are you posing for selfie? I will, yes. Yes, I will, I will. Okay. Awesome.
Oh, good. <laughs> All right, then. All right. Where are you? All right, guys. Good to you all. Good to see you, guys. Looking forward to staying in touch. We're going to do a lot of great things together. Yeah, sure. We will. We'll connect um, on LinkedIn and um, get together. I need to know more about what you do, and um, we need to get um, to push this. Thank you so much for your commitment, and thank you for all you do. God bless you, brother. Thank you.